stay in this moment for a minute, okay? Listen. Thank God the Masters got delayed yesterday, so you don't have to worry about missing the fourth round, okay? Stay in this moment. The Easter hunts, they're going to happen. Lunch is going to happen. One of my favorite things that happened since 2020 is the challenge for me to be present in the moments. Can you do me a favor and stay present in this moment? Everything else that's going to happen today is going to happen, and it's going to happen perfectly. And by perfectly, I mean chaotically, but it will still be perfect because your perspective of what happens this afternoon is more important than the perfection of what your expectation came with. Because I got a word for you. But, but I want to stay in this moment because Tania just said something while we were worshiping. And if you get around church folk long enough, they'll tell you that it was wrong. So I want to stay here. What she said was that because Jesus is worthy and he lives in you, that makes you worthy. That because Jesus is perfect and Jesus lives in you, that makes you perfect. And you get around Christians and they'll immediately dismiss because they know that their actions aren't perfect. But your actions have never defined your perfection. Jesus' actions did. Which means we can celebrate this morning because you are perfect because of Christ in you. It is the most humble thing you can do because what you're saying, it's not about your efforts. It's not about your church attendance. It's not about how much you give. It's not about how well you serve. It's about believing the truth that Jesus made you perfect on the cross. Jesus made you righteous on the cross. Jesus made you worthy on the cross. So maybe you can leave this service and, and, and maybe you came with this perspective of, man, I'm just going to come to church because it's what you do on Easter. My friends, you came to this church to be revived. You came to this church because we are a church that is more known for telling you who you are, not who you are not. And maybe you walked into this place, maybe a little bit of shame, maybe a little condemnation. Romans 8, 1, there is now no more condemnation because of Christ. So can we just remove that from our mentality today? Can we just sit in this moment and recognize, oh my goodness, God has been more pleased with me than I ever thought. God has been more in love with me than I ever could have imagined. Because this is your truth. And, and, and here's, here's what's crazy. Is if that truth makes you uncomfortable... Don't be mad at that truth because it makes you uncomfortable. Be mad at the lie that made you comfortable. Because the message of Jesus is that you are worthy. You're his beloved. The message of Jesus is you are loved in spite of your actions. And maybe when you recognize that you're loved in spite of your actions, maybe your actions will begin to change more than you ever could have thought trying to do your checklist. Jesus has qualified you. He's never been disappointed with you. I'm, I know that might be hard to swallow, but the Father has never been disappointed in you because when he looks at you, he sees his beloved Jesus, and you are uniquely loved by the Father, and that's what we came to celebrate today. Jesus didn't just get up today. He got up 2,000 years ago, so every day in the modern 21st century American church should be Easter because we celebrate the King of Kings and the risen Lord because he rose to give you life and life to the fullest. And so we celebrate that. Can a celebrate a church, give praise to Jesus this morning for making us worthy, making us good. Thank you, worship team. Can we give it up for our worship team? Amazing choir, amazing. Hey, if you got little kids, Pastor Tish, you can't see her because she's way tiny, but she's waving her hand like she care. If the little kids, you guys are dismissed, you can get up out of here, be gone, give some people some leg room. That's good news. You can find your seat, parents, adults, teens. You guys good on this Easter Sunday? One person, Teresa. Teresa and Marty on the front row are the only people excited about Easter this morning. Are you guys excited? If you can't tell, I'm a hollaback preacher. All that means is, if I'm preaching good, you can holler back. If that makes you uncomfortable, just nod your head. I believe it's a sin to be boring, and so we ain't going to commit sins this morning. You good? 
Good. It's a great day. It is a great, great day. If you're new around here, welcome. My name is Corey. I'm part of the teaching team. If you're looking for a personality to get attached to, this church ain't it because we got a plethora of people that speak. So if you come back next week because you thought I was good, there's going to be somebody different. But guess what? They are just as good. So come on back next week. It's going to be a great time. Today we are talking about resurrected Jesus. We're t- What'd you say, Shanik? I hope you think it's good because our lead pastor's preaching next week. <laughs> just so you know. Oh, I love you, Pastor. Baptizing your kids got to be one of the most cool things on the planet. I don't know if you guys noticed. If you didn't, uh, that last kid up on stage, and not really up on stage, but in the water was his son. And I just, I just watched you baptize your son. I, that's got to be the greatest moment on the planet. Good talk. All right, get ready to get the message. Is that awkward for everybody else? Good. So we've been in this sermon series called Eden. And what we've been talking about the last couple weeks, I know if, you, if you've missed it, I'm just going to catch you up real quick. It's not really controversial. I just want you to be informed about it is in Christian culture, you know there's a lot of debate about things in the Bible, about things in life, and I think that the disagreement is beautiful. I really do. Because God didn't call us to uniformity. He called us to unity, but not uniformity, which means that you don't have to believe everything that we believe here to belong. And this should be a, a, a safe place for you to question things, to doubt some things, to be okay with thinking that you're right and then finding out that you're wrong about some things. It's okay because I'm wrong a lot of times. If you disagree with me this morning, welcome to the club. Sometimes I preach and I get off stage and go, wow, I think I disagree with myself. <laughs> and we're in this journey together. Faith isn't about having all the right answers. Faith is about being vulnerable and willing to admit when you're wrong, willing to recognize that this walk with Jesus isn't always easy. But if you get around some safe people, a walk with Jesus can be filled with faith and love and laughter because the only thing that matters in the kingdom of God is that you love people well, not that you believe all the right things. And this idea around Eden, you know, you grow around Christians, you read Genesis chapter 1, you find out that there's this creation story according to the Bible that began in Eden, and you know there's a lot of debate around that, whether or not it was a figurative garden or a literal garden, and we told you in week one in this series that in my opinion, I don't really think that matters. What matters is that you recognize that what Jesus did, he got up in a garden so that you and I could permanently live in a garden called Eden, and this garden is within you. This is what this whole sermon series has been about, so if you've missed it, you're caught up. My goal today is to remind you and to empower you that Eden lives within you, and Eden represents perfect union with God. My friends, regardless of what you've believed in your life, you have always been in perfect union with God. You just might not have known it. And so my hope and goal today is to inspire you and to remind you that you are most like God when you're doing two things, when you're serving and when you're creating. And I got a challenge for us, if you're willing to accept that, around what you are tending to in your garden. You see, it's a lot more clever than you think it is. All right, a couple, couple people on board. All right, I got a passage of scripture I'm going to read. It has nothing to do with my message. I just thought it was really funny. And then we're going to dive into the good stuff. Cool? Are you sure? All right, John chapter 20. John chapter 20. I just want to remind you that the, that the disciple whom Jesus loved, his name was John, he writes about himself like that, okay? That's not funny to you? Okay. What we're about to read was written by a guy who speaks about himself in the third person, and in the third person, he tells his audience that he was the disciple that Jesus loved. And I love that. And and maybe the only Easter message you need to hear is that you are the disciple whom Jesus loves. And maybe you should talk about yourself a little bit higher. Because if you don't talk about yourself the way that God the Father talks about yourself, somebody's wrong and it's not God. And maybe we've gotten humility a little bit wrong in the church because we like to bash people up instead of reminding them that the way that Jesus views you is righteous. So maybe you should pick up some righteousness today and recognize that it's a freely gift for you to just receive, not to act out. Oh, it's good stuff. John chapter 1, or John chapter 20, verse 1. It says, early on the first day, this is right after the resurrection of Jesus, uh, of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Madeline, you know, a woman, was the first person in the tomb, 
in a culture that didn't respect women, and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance, verse 2. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved. John is writing about himself right there. You see it? That is hilarious. And said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple, himself, started for the tomb. Uh, Pastor Shanick preached this like four years ago, and I've never, I've never forgotten it because it's so funny. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. <laughs> Leave that verse up there. If anybody tells you that talking trash in athletics is wrong, <laughs> just show them this biblical verse. John, John writes about himself in the third person that lets you know that he outran Peter and got to the tomb first. I love me some John. He bent over and looked in at the stri strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him. Again, he's letting you know that John got there first, and Peter got there second, and Peter is lame. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Now, that is like a crazy revelation, but I'm not going to dive in there there. Finally, the other disciple... <laughs> read that with me. Come on. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first. I mean... I don't know if, if John is insecure or not, but he's letting everybody know that he is better than Peter, and I'm here for it. I am here for this message. If you don't think the Bible is entertaining, then you really don't read the Bible, because I read that, and I was laughing. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. Now, verse 9, crazy verse. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Okay, I'm going to pick up in verse 11 in just a second, but I just want to stay here for a minute because I want to remind you that proper humility, a famous quote by C.S. Lewis, is not thinking of yourself less. It's just thinking less. No, it's not thinking less of yourself, just of yourself less. So proper humility is not being like, oh, you know, you get around some weird Christian folk. They'll be like, now you can't say that about yourself there, boy. You got to make sure you're humble. You got to make sure you think lowly about yourself. You're just a little rotten sinner. And we laugh at that because the reality is, is Jesus doesn't view you as a sinner. He views you as a saint. Because you're made in his image and likeness, according to Genesis 1.27. Which means that what Adam did in the garden isn't more powerful than what Jesus did on the cross. So you should walk confidently knowing who you are because you are a son or a daughter of the royal king of kings, which means you're royalty. And we say that a lot in this church because people need to be reminded every single week that you are royalty and you don't walk around like a king overpowering people, but when you know you're loved, you're empowering people. And this is the message that should be so attractive to the American church today because the reality is, is you are kings and you are queens to love your neighborhood and serve them well. And if John could show us anything in this moment, right before Jesus reveals himself after the resurrection, I think you should recognize that you should talk about yourself a little bit more like John talks about himself. Because you are the son or the daughter whom Jesus loves. And God has always been well pleased with you. So we pick up the story to where I want to dive into. I haven't heard an Easter sermon on this before. So uh, it's just going to be, we're, we're going to see where it goes. Is that cool? Some of you that know me regularly know it could get spicy and dicey real quick, but I think it's going to be simple, okay? Verse 11, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? I think it's very appropriate for you to talk to your wife this way. <laughs> I am just kidding. <laughs> do not do that. Is my wife in here? Wave your oh, my, oh, no. Okay, I was going to tell a story about you, but we're going to move right on. <laughs> and saw two angels. Okay, the, verse 13. Uh, no, they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Okay? So she notices Jesus, but didn't recognize Jesus. I love this. 
He asked her, woman, why are you crying? You see, I think it's appropriate if Jesus says it. <laughs> woman, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Who is it that you are looking for? Now, check this. If you got a, if you got a Bible that's like written, I know that's really hard in, in 2023. If, if your Bible's not glowing, I think you can highlight this. Um, thinking he was the gardener. I want you to underline that. Because we read that and we're like, okay, she just mistaken him for a gardener. But I think she prophetically spoke something over Jesus that is something for us today, 2,100 years later, 20, 2,000 years later. You get it. Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. Now, now pay attention to the scriptures. Mary, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. At the sound of her name, she recognized Jesus. But she first mistaken Jesus for a gardener. Now, here's why I don't think it was a mistake. In John chapter 15, a couple chapters earlier, John chapter 15, it's going to be on the screen. Jesus is speaking again, and he says this in verse 1. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Now, Jesus in another passage of Scripture says that he only does what he sees his Father doing, which means if God the Father is the great gardener and Jesus, who gets mistaken at the resurrection as the great gardener, then maybe there's some prophetic prophecy over our lives that we are great gardeners. See where I'm going today? It's about to be good. He says this. He cuts off, now terrible translation, that that word means uh, to raise up. Have you ever seen a, a vineyard? And if you've ever seen vines just taking over, you don't, you don't cut them just to cut them. You cut them to tie them up so that they can grow properly. So God the Father isn't cutting you off for your mistakes. He's lifting you up in spite of your mistakes so that you might believe what is actually true about you. So he lifts up the vine that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. This is the Greek word for cleans. When did you get cleaned? Not when you repented. You were clean 2,000 years ago because Jesus is more powerful than your ability to repent. (laughs) So my friends, you have always been clean. And maybe if you haven't been living that way, maybe it's because no one told you that you were clean because you will start to live the way that you are proclaimed about, which means my job as a preacher isn't to condemn you. My job as a preacher is declare what Jesus declared over you. So he cleanses us. Thank God for the cross because he cleanses us. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. If you disagree with me, you've got to disagree with John chapter 15, verse 3. You are already clean. Already clean, because of the word I have spoken to you. Verse 4, now he says, remain in me. It also is the Greek word to abide in, or to make your home in, or to wake up to the garden within. See, we're a lot more clever than you think we are when we did this series six weeks ago, talking about Eden, tying it all the way up to this idea that you are a great gardener. Stay with me. Remain in me, and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. I must remain in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. The reason for why we believe You believe not to make it true. It's always been true. You believe to activate the truth so that you actually live it out. When people hear grace, they get really scared because they think that people are going to go and do whatever they want to do. My friends, you've already been doing whatever you wanted to do. You don't need grace to give you a, a free pass to do whatever you, do, you want to do. You need grace to remind you that you are empowered to bear good fruit, which means our purpose is to do good deeds, not to gain a blessing. It's to do good deeds because you already know you're blessed. And if the church could wake up to this reality, it would change the world because there's far too many Christians that are only doing good things to gain a blessing and it reveals your motivation for why you follow Jesus. You do good things because you know you're already seated with Christ. You do good things because you recognize that this is the best life ever, not because you just prayed for it and became a reality. It's because it is a reality, so you walk in the fullness of this reality. My friends, I want to challenge you today around this idea 
that because Jesus is a great gardener and the great gardener lives in you, then what does your garden look like? Because in the kingdom of God, grace empowers people to say no to sin, but grace also empowers people to take some responsibility. And this is where people do get a little bit uncomfortable because the reality is, is you have a garden to be tending and have you been tending to it? You have a responsibility and it's not to change the world, it's to change your world. You were never designed and created to change the world. Think about it from Jesus' perspective. He didn't even change the first century world. They killed him. So what makes you think that you can change the world? Mother Teresa didn't even change the world because it's still pretty crazy out there, right? But what would happen if we picked up some responsibility to tend to our own gardens and change our individual worlds? So let's talk about our gardens today because I can get super inspirational and preach a great revelation for you. But sometimes when you get around church folk and you teach them about grace, the common question is, just tell me what to do, preacher. And I don't like telling people what to do because I'm unqualified to tell you how to live, but I am qualified to tell you how loved you are. But let's tell you what to do then, okay? I'm, I've heard you. I'm going to tell you all what you want to do today, okay? And if this isn't good enough, that's on you. You can say whatever you want to people, huh? Here, here's the two things, okay? There's a difference between purpose and passion. Purpose and passion. Every single one of us in this room has the exact same purpose. I know you might not have been taught that, but we all have the exact same purpose. You know what that purpose is? To love people well. Now, your passions will determine the area of influence that you are given to fulfill the purpose of loving people well. Now, you might be looking at me and saying, I'm a little turned off by that dude's passion, and that's okay. But I recognize that my passion is to tell people how loved they are, and if you're uncomfortable with that, it's okay. I love you. I, welcome, welcome, welcome. But my purpose is to love you well in spite of our differences and disagreements. That's hard to do. It's also why I think God loves to live in the gray. So many times I get around people that are like, I wish God was just black and white on this subject. And maybe, maybe God was on purpose gray because it's harder to love somebody well when you disagree about what they believe and how they vote. So your garden. Are you tending to your garden well? I got five things that you need to start doing. Couple chuckles, we'll get there. Okay? If you're taking notes, write these things down. If you're not taking notes, write these things down. Pull out your phones. If you got your phones, paper, whatever, write these things down. Because I know some of you guys are going to family things today, whatever it is you do on Easter. Talk about this with your spouse. Talk about this with a friend. Talk about this with family. I'm curious because I don't believe in just preaching to inspire you for 60 minutes. I believe in preaching to actually help change your life. And so if you just came to be entertained this morning, if you just came to check off church, off your list of things you think you need to be doing, what's the point? I want to give you something that can actually help you in your walk with Jesus, okay? And so it's going to be very simple today, and it's not going to be, like, revolutionary, okay? You're going to, most of you in this room are probably like, wow, I've already been doing that. Well, great. It's that simple. It really is that simple. Here's what I want to challenge you. You're made in his image and likeness, and if we're made in his image and likeness, and the very first thing God does is create, then you and I should be creating. You and I should be creating. And this looks different for every single person, depending on your passions. Now, as you pursue your passions, your purpose is to love people that you come into contact with. But I want to encourage you today, what are you creating? What kind of family life are you creating? What kind of marriage are you creating? What kind of kids are you creating? And I'm not talking about literally there. <laughs> what? I didn't get that joke. Ask your 15-year-old. They understood it. What are you creating? What kind of business are you creating? What kind of work environment are you creating? Because you know you're responsible for the work environment. If you hate your work environment, look at yourself. You want to change your work environment? Look at yourself. Maybe if a bunch of people that showed up to Hill City Church on Sunday walked into their offices tomorrow on Monday and brought Eden with them because it's within you, I guarantee you your work office environment is going to change because you have a, a word for every person you meet. 
you have power because Christ got up to give you power. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and active in you. It's time for us to use that power to empower people. And so how do you create a garden? Or in other words, are you tending your own garden? My friends, I heard somebody say this the other day. I disagreed with it, and I've been thinking about it for about five weeks, and I agree with it now. And they said, we don't build the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God was already built. We simply participate in it. And so, my friends, I want to encourage you is how are you participating in the kingdom of God that is alive and active because the kingdom of God is not a physical kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom that impacts your physical kingdom. So how to create a garden that flourishes because when you're tending to a garden, things live. That's why when you don't tend your garden, it gets overran by weeds and it represents death. So five ways because five is the number of grace. How to create a garden that flourishes, and then we'll be out of here. Good? I got about like 12 more minutes. Cool? Okay, five ways to create a garden that flourishes, and they're really simple. Again, write them down. If you don't write them down, I'm judging you. (laughs) Number one, create an affirming motto. What are you talking about, Corey? I'm talking about The way you speak about yourself is the most important thing on the planet right now. And I'm talking about aligning how you speak about yourself to how the Father speaks about you. Because your biggest enemy is not the devil. Your biggest enemy is you. You will disqualify yourself. You will talk yourself out of starting that company and quitting your job. You will speak all kinds of negativity about your spouse to yourself. You will believe lies, and you will walk in those lies when you don't first, every morning, get up and speak an affirmation about yourself. Now, this can be a family code. You know, Pastor Shannon talks a lot about his family code. I thought about a family code, and there's not a lot of great letters or words that start with the letters R-I-C-E, because that's my last name. I was like, that's really clever for the bandits, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. If you were to ask my kids, this is what we do every single morning. I've shared this before. When I drop them off at school, I say, who are you? They say, we're Rices. And I say, what are Rices? And they say, kings and queens. And I say, what do kings and queens do? And they say, show honor and be fun. Those are the only two rules in our household. Why? We don't harp on them about lying. We harp on them that when they lie, they didn't show honor. So the only rules that matter in the Rice household is are you honoring people? And are you being fun? Because I am not going to raise a bunch of Christian kids that are not fun. (laughs) We have a pool in our house. They are not allowed to enter the pool by the stairs. Because you only enter the pool with a cannonball. (laughs) Especially when mom is around with her clothes on and doesn't want to get wet. Because there's far too many boring Christians out there who are not making the kingdom of God attractive. We should be the most fun people on the planet. And maybe you need to redefine what you think fun is. Because Christians are alive. We should be alive. But too many people are walking around dead as if you don't have resurrection power within. So create an affirming motto. I do counseling. And one of the things we do is I I challenge the people that I do one-on-one counseling is create an affirming motto. In fact, one of the people that I've been doing counseling, they came up with this, this motto. It's really simple. They said this, I'm ready to go to the next level. I can do hard things, and I won't settle for less than what I deserve. I love that motto. I have a, I have a motto. It, it goes like this, I love me. I love me. If you don't like me, you're missing out. I love me. My wife loves me. That's all I need. Shannon loves me. He's in that little circle. I love me. I am whole and perfect as I was created. I am not my body. I am not my accomplishments. I am not my ac- uh, accumulations, and I am not. I'm not my body. Did I say that already? I've messed up my own motto. Let me say it again because I wrote it down. I am not my body. I am not my accumulations. I am not my achievements. I am not my reputation. Why? Because I need to start every single morning reminding myself of who I am because of who my Father views me to be. Because, and this is why it's so important for you to love yourself, you will never be able to love people like Christ if you don't love yourself first. What makes you think that you will be able to love other people well when you don't love you? 
And the Father, again, I want to remind you, he looks at you and views you as worthy because Jesus lives in you. This isn't a message to just be like, wow, I can just go be crazy. Who wants to go and live and be crazy? What I want to do is I want to create an environment of people that know who they are and empower every single person they meet because it is so much better to give than to receive. I think that's in the Bible somewhere. Create an affirming motto because if you can't speak positively about yourself, you're never going to be able to see, speak positively about others which Jesus has already given us a purpose to love other people well. So my friends, please start speaking good about yourself. Fall in love with you. Maybe the best thing you could do this Easter season is begin to fall in love with you. Again, I, I love this. Number two is this. Again, they all start with create because you are never more like the creator of the universe than when you are creating. Create a space for intimacy. Now you talk and preach your boy. Create a space for intimacy. What matters more to you in your garden? The things you accomplish, your work, how much money you make, or your family? And if those first three are more important to you than your family, I ain't mad at you. Just admit it. Because are you creating a space of intimacy within the people that you love the most? Because that's the really only thing that matters. If you're tending to your garden, then your marriage should be thriving because you, men, I'm talking mostly to you, have created a space of intimacy. When's the last time you take your wife out on a date? Well, Corey, why are we talking about this? Let's talk about resurrection Jesus because it's easier to talk about things about Jesus without actually applying it to our lives, right? Here's what I mean by this. Men, if you don't already have one day a month guaranteed on your calendar for a date night, you need to start doing it. It will be the best thing for your marriage when you start making effort for your marriage. You weren't dull when you got married, so why are you dull now? I thought I was going to get a lot of amens from the women. <laughs> for sure. This past, and date nights don't have to be crazy. The first Thursday of every single month, my wife and I go on a date night. Non-negotiable, okay? We get sitters. I don't even worry about money. If you know me, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm very frugal. Some people call me cheap. <laughs> frugal. I'm frugal. But our date night, mmm. Make it rain, baby. <laughs> sometimes we go to nice restaurants. Sometimes we go to the same restaurant. Sometimes we just go to Dragon King's Daughter because it's both our favorites. Sometimes... Sometimes we go do activities. Like this past Thursday night, we went and played pickleball, and I smoked her. <laughs> She's not very good, but I had a lot of fun beating her, just so you know. They're like, wow, you're really insecure to be telling everybody, I love me. <laughs> <laughs> ah, seriously, any couples out there want to be smoked, me and my wife will take you out. Tania, I'm looking at you and Teddy. Where's your husband? He's in the back. Teddy, you listening? Talking trash to you, just like the disciple whom Jesus loves. <laughs> Seriously, man, we have to create a space of intimacy within our wives and our marriages. And, and it doesn't have to look like a date night. Figure it out for what works for you guys. And I know that there are different seasons, so don't walk out of here with condemnation. Look, I, we got an 11 month too. We get that it's hard. Come find me. I will help you find some safe sitters. We've got a bunch that we can give you contacts. And my sitters who are in here, sorry, I'm about to give your numbers out for free. But holler at your boy. I think they're like $25 an hour. Okay. <laughs> I was trying to help you guys, whatever. Create a space of intimacy. Number three is this, is create an avenue for connection with your kids. Again, this is, we're talking about the garden. Eden is within you. Eden is your family. Create an avenue for connection with your kids. One of the best things I've ever done was from my man Josh. My man Josh McCain, he's over there. He did something with his kids, and that day I stole it because I loved it. He said he created a handshake with each one of his kids. And so I went to my kids, and I was like, you guys want to do a handshake? And they're like, yeah, Henry, my man, we have the same handshake every single night. Scarlett changes depending on her mood. She messes it up a lot. It's, some of it's inappropriate, but I just roll with it because that's my girl. It gets really weird sometimes, so don't judge me. 
But every single night before they go to bed, because I did this handshake with them two years ago, we do our handshake. In fact, it's so annoying that sometimes when I don't want to tuck them into bed, because it was one of those nights, she'll come up and be like, Daddy, you didn't do our handshake. Like, get into bed. You're just doing this to get out of bed. You're just stalling. She knows what stalling is now, and she loves it. She loves to stall. Dad, I'm not stalling. And she looks at me with those eyes. Part of our handshake involves me throwing her into bed. It started when she was two years old, and now it's six, and so I'm like <sighs> huffing and puffing. But I'm serious. Go home. What did the preacher talk about Easter? Oh, I got to create some weird handshake with my kid. Do it. And if your kids are too old for a handshake, create a space for them. Maybe it's mandates. Maybe it's daddy-daughter dates. Maybe it's 10 minutes a day with each kid without a phone for intentionality. You can do that. Are you creating space within your family? And I'm not just talking to the men here. I'm talking to the women as well. Are you creating connection points with your kids? Because that's how you tend to your garden. Maybe if your kids are older, maybe it's taking them out to lunch once a month, and investing in them by pouring words of life over them, reminding them of who they are, reminding them that you're proud of them, even if their actions don't line up with your perspectives and points of view. Number four, I love this one. Create a budget of good stewardship. Oh, here goes the turn, talking about, talking about giving, the church talking about giving. I ain't talking about giving to this church. I'm talking about you getting on a budget. I don't care how wealthy you are. Every single human being should be on a budget. Budgets are not restrictions. Budgets actually help you flourish. Because if you don't know where every dollar is going to, then you're not being a good steward, no matter how big your bank account is. You know, 72% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. That's crazy high. Maybe if we got on budget and started to understand our responsibility in the kingdom of God is to tend our gardens, maybe we would get into a place where a year from now wouldn't look the same as today. Create a budget of good stewardship. I'm telling you, it's that simple. But when you tend to your gardens, your world begins to flourish. And lastly, number five, Tim, come out here. Make me sound beautiful as I land this plane. Create an environment where others matter. Why is that number five? Shouldn't that be number one? No, I'm telling you, these are in order on purpose. Because your gardens need to be taken care of. They need to be tended to. You need to take care of yourself first, then your spouse. And if you don't got a spouse, just skip to number four. Then your kids. Then your budget. And lastly, then others. But every single month... You should be doing something for others as a family. Seriously. Maybe it's just serving as a family once a month somewhere. I'm not talking about in the church. We got a lot of ministry partners that we do life with in this community. If you want some information on some of the people that we do life with in ministry that are doing incredible things right here in southern Indiana, we can get you in contact. You know how amazing it would be if we found out that families from Hill City Church started to give back to the communities by presently being there? You have a strong stance about pro-life versus pro-choice, then why don't you get involved in Choices Life Resource Center and go help some people that are having a crisis and don't know what to do? We have far too many Christians that have a lot of opinions in the political and religious field, but they're not doing anything. Again, people should be attracted to who Christians are, not because we know how to pick it, but because we know how to love. Because it's beauty that will change the world. Are you creating an environment where others are being lifted up? And maybe it's not serving as a family. Maybe that's unrealistic for the season of life that you're in. Maybe, maybe it's every single day you're going to go into work and you're going to make it your mission to speak one kind word to somebody. Every single person on the planet could do that. Maybe you're going to pray about it as you go to, uh, go to work every single day. Say, Father, would you just put somebody on my heart that needs a word of encouragement? I promise you, he will. You'll start to see people differently, especially those people that are so easy. You know, you know what I'm talking about. So easy to be like, oh gosh, here they come. Did they see me? Maybe you could 
look at them in the face and recognize that maybe they haven't had somebody look them in the eyes for so long and they're crying out inappropriately. They're crying out for attention because they never got that. And maybe they're just living with a narcissistic wound, you know, something they should have gotten as a child and they never received it. And maybe they can receive it from you because you can look at them instead of being annoyed by them, you can engage with them and empower them and encourage them. Maybe it's having a family over for dinner once a month, inviting them into your home. Maybe it's going out in the lobby and noticing a family that might not have a family to go spend Easter with. And maybe, you know, you got thousands of eggs already hidden at your house. Maybe you could go invite somebody who you know doesn't live here or doesn't live around family that's here and maybe invite them to your Easter because life is better connected. And at Hill City Church, we refuse to be a church that condemns people. We want to empower people. But there's no point in empowering people if you're not connecting with people because we are not meant to do life alone. So I want to encourage you. Every single one of you has a garden. And we're to be tending to that garden, creating safe spaces for people to flourish, creating safe spaces for our marriage to thrive, for our kids to grow up in and want to be home when they leave. Man, my wife and I, we're working really hard in creating a home that our kids want to be home when they get kicked out, because they will get kicked out. But in a loving way, so hopefully they want to come over all the time because they know, at least in my house, they're not going to be judged. At least in my house, I'm going to speak to who they are, not who they're not. At least in my house, they're going to be reminded that they're royalty, because that's who they are. So my friends at Hill City Church, we want to remind you this Easter that Jesus got up so that you could thrive by knowing who you are. Because the Father is so well pleased with you, so in love with you, and it would be a shame for you to walk out of here with shame. He loves you. He's proud of you. And he's empowering you to tend to your garden. So friends, is that good? Can we wake up to our Eden that's within us? Can we wake up to the truth of who we are as sons and daughters in the living King of Kings, Lord of Lords? And that's a good Sunday. Was that good? Did I bore you? Did I bore you, Daniel? No, I love you, Daniel. Church, we hope you have a great Easter today. Maybe you can walk out of this place with your head a little bit high because you know who you are. Maybe you can tend to your gardens a little bit differently this week. It'll take time. There's grace for you. And maybe you come back next week because I know Pastor Shane has got another word that will re-empower you after you've been beat up by the world for the next six days. Sometimes you need a little church to remind yourself that you are good, that you are loved, that you are valuable and worthy because of Christ in you. We love you, church. We're proud of you, church. Go love somebody today and make sure you hide $100 bills in my kids' Easter eggs. We love you so much. Church, you are loved, and there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. We will see you next week. Come on back. We'll see you next week.